Okay. Let's start, since it was the first on the list, with Alma del Core by Aldara. Okay, how many of you have sung this or played some, for someone who has? It's in the double dozen, so lots of people have sung it. You know what I'm talking about? 24 Italian songs and artists. Yeah. yeah, it's in that book, so lots of people have dealt with it. Uh, this is Amber's work. She graciously agreed to let me photocopy it so we could have something as a basis for discussion. Um, what was the main point of this? We were trying to say how harmonic function, all those concepts that we presented on, on harmonic function, how that pertains here to this hopefully familiar song. Let's listen to Pavarotti singing it. I hope you listened to this already, so this is not brand new for you. What is your first way of approaching um, a passage like this? What do you do first? When you're trying to make sense of it all, what would be a good start? If, if we're thinking about harmonic function. Identifying the key. Yes, know the key. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, you got to get the context for it. Mm -hmm. Cadence. You know that. What's that? Cadence. Cadence, yeah. Excellent. Um, we talked about how those functions show how you progress toward a cadence. And you can't have a cadence without progression, right? Chord changes must occur or you don't really have a cadence at all. And and the phrase model says, here's how phrases tend to go. They tend to run through these functions. Some of them might be elaborated. They might be prolonged. But that's progression. And we expect that to play out over the course of a phrase. There's a wrinkle here. See the functions in parentheses? So the phrase model this series of harmonic functions does not always get you to a cadence and it doesn't here. You don't hear a cadence in measure three, do you? That one is not the end. It goes right by it, doesn't it? The music continues on to the downbeat of measure four. So this is really a four bar phrase going on here. And that first run through that phrase model, through those harmonic functions, predominant, dominant, tonic, does not create a cadence. And you have to wait. Well, it's just one more in this case. The phrase model says end on tonic, but we're ending on the dominant. Well, yeah, that's what happens when you have a half cadence. But the model is still important for us. In fact, the absence of a final tonic here is really important as a, as a resource for composition. You understand what I mean by that? How is this useful to have this idea as a backdrop for the music? Do we appreciate this in a special way because we don't get the tonic? It's normal to want it to resolve and to have it actually eventually get to the tonic, right? So what special significance does this have? What's the effect? It keeps it moving. Mm-hmm. It's like, you know, the cliffhanger. Ooh, and you never ooh, get there, you know. You're, you just you want you want closure, and so you deny it in order to give it later. And you see how that happens later. Mm -hmm. These phrases, we said there are two of them, combine into something bigger, which we're going to talk a little bit about today. Because phrase structure, remember what Rothstein said about phrase structure? It's hierarchical. That means there are levels of it. Some are inclusive and include smaller chunks. So these smaller things group together to form something bigger. These are phrases. What's this? The big, the whole excerpt. What is that? A period. Yes. So phrases combine to form periods because you're able to play with our expectations and deny closure and then deliver it later. Just think how many movies would just be so lame if they didn't have these, these scenes where there was no resolution and you want to know what's going to happen next. So, or if it's a series, you're going to come back next week, right? And they want you to come back because they got ads to show you. <laughs> come on. <laughs> How are they going to pay their bills? This is important. <laughs> yeah, so they want to leave you on the cliff's edge so that then they can come back next week and have you watch again and then find 
the season, actually, even a season end does not usually end, it's right? Even. Then they make it an even bigger. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's not the best example. But a lot of movies will end with some closure at the end. And that, that is just so much a part of art in general, to leave some unanswered question so that then we pick up with it and provide the conclusion. And then the conclusion matters because you couldn't get it, right? The crisis in the movie, the thing that isn't resolved, like the dominant. And then, ah, oh, you get it later. Isn't that what a lot of art is about? Not all, by any stretch, but that's one sort of thing that art does. <laughs> Set an expectation and create tension by not delivering. You want everything denouement, right? You want it all settled. You want them married or whatever. And they keep on having issues that they can't get married the whole movie, and finally they are. <laughs> okay, here's the marriage right here. Ah, here we go. Okay, so... This little faint at closure here is not closure for several reasons. Let's talk about why this. Even though it's progression does not end anything. It's in the middle of something, not the end. Why is that? Why is that tonic in measure three not that arrival that we desire? Because, well, I mean, it's, it's obviously serving a different function because it's not cadential. It doesn't have... Mm -hmm. it's, it is not part of the cadence for the phrase. Mm -hmm. So why is it though? Can you look at some? What about its sound? Just doesn't. Why is it just not ending? The melody's not there. Good. Melodic activity. The rhythmic energy is not dispelled. It just keeps pushing forward. That's important. The bass. Gwen, you mentioned that earlier, right? Was that you? Or was that you, Amber? One, one of you guys were talking with me about this earlier and said, yeah, how the mel the melodic activity keeps the ball rolling, so to speak. And then the bass is also, it's a 1-6 chord, so there's not really any finality to it. Oh, wait, now, there is a 1-6 in, put a 6 on that second one, the one in measure 2, that is a 1-6, but the one in measure 3 is a root position one. Yes, oh, I'm sorry, I was talking about the second measure. Oh, okay. I thought that's what we were talking. I'm sorry, I'm well, that, confused. The melody sort of the melody escapes to a different a non chord tone. It goes well. It, it goes to a non chord tone. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, that's part like, of that activity. You're talking about the melody not being conclusive. That's kind of why. That's mm -hmm. pretty yeah, much. yeah. If you're only looking at that one beat, I mean, obviously there's a right. couple more beats to the melody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's true. The five sounds more like an arrival than a tonic. Can you see why? You go for it. <laughs> but you don't go for... <laughs> I mean, it just doesn't do it, right? What's wrong? Beat three, good. So metrical placement. Melodic activity... And metrical placement. And if we're talking about avoiding closure, that means putting it in a weak or on a weak beat. Yeah, a weak place, whatever that might be. It might not be on the beat, but you know, somewhere in a, in a weak metrical position. And it doesn't sound like you arrived on it. So we're going to see that these ideas come back in the Rostock article. Melodic activity, the kind of note you're on and the, and the rhythm of it. He didn't talk about the rhythm so much there, but... So maybe not quite that one so much, but definitely metrical placement is going to play a role um, for him too. Not like this exactly, but you'll, you'll see there is a connection there. Okay, and then... See how it's approached? No, it's a dominant, but what's the dominant chord? Seven, Seven diminished six. Not the stable thing that a dominant would be. And so you don't have that sense of, okay, here I am, and then from this place I launch into the tonic and I feel a real sense of ending. Instead, we're just kind of, whoops, sliding into it. You know, it's a very different feeling 
we come from a substitute chord to the one with all its instability. Then to go five root position, one root position. Very different. And that's what you're going to get over here. You're going to get root position five, and you're going to get a root position one. We're not getting that here. That's important too. So uh, either inversion. So if that had been a five, four, three, it would have sounded very similar. We could say, hey, that's a, that's a five, it's inverted. Or a substitute. For, for, for whatever function it might be. So normally you get 5, but this is not 5, it's 7. Or if we had a situation, this doesn't happen here, but another instance would be not 1, but 3. So not the primary chord that you expect, but a substitute for it will usually keep the ball rolling. A chordal substitute for a primary chord, if we were going to spell that all the way out. Good. Now, one more thing about this. It's like, this is grammatically correct, but it's not done. It doesn't form a full sentence. I like to use um, two sentences together to make this point. Elvis has left the building. <laughs> Elvis hates screaming fans. I shall not sure he hated them. He was just gone. Okay, but just work with me a little bit here. Elvis, I'm going to put these two together now. So this is a complete thought because there is a subject, a verb has left, and an object. What did he leave? The building. Elvis is again a subject. The verb is hate. And then this, the fans are the object of his hatred. Elvis, who hates screaming fans, has left the Okay, so we have our tonic chord. No, 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 sorry. <laughs> we have our subject, we have a verb, and an object. But whoops, that's parenthetical. It's a complete thought, potentially, but now it's tucked inside of a larger phrase, a sentence, actually. In language, it's a sentence. And then has left is our verb, and then we have an object over here. So, yes, this does do subject, verb, object, but to get the complete thought, we have to go on over here. This is subordinate to that. That who erodes its stability, so to speak, and makes it tacked on to something else. Just like this substitute chord doesn't allow it to fully end but tax it on to something else. So we know we're not done, and, and so it continues. Now, the tonic at the beginning is the tonic for this progression, and it's the tonic for the progression to the dominant two. Just like Elvis here is the subject for both of the, these two ideas, this one and this one. But this, the stuff in the commas, is tucked away inside the larger thing. So this is called this right here, an embedded progression. The word who is sort of like a substitute. Yeah, kind of. Mm -hmm. Not that every single sentence structured that way would have the exact If I could do like hating, oh, this hating those screaming fans, then it would be more like that, wouldn't it? Because then it'd be the word, one of the essential words, altered to make sure that you need it. That's a cool idea. That'd be an even better analogy with the, the musical situation. In a way, we're diagramming phrases, right? We're diagramming sentences when we do this stuff with tonic, predominant, dominant, tonic. That's what we're doing. 
Why is that important to us? Well, actually, when you're learning a new language, like when I was learning German, that was really useful to know the grammar. It's kind of useful to know grammar when you're learning English, right? It helps you. It's like a leg up. You know what? This common practice, music, probably isn't your native language exactly. It's just one option on your palette of sounds. In fact, if you listen to the blues, what do the 12-bar what do blues do? 12-bar blues. They're not going to do common practice stuff. It goes to 4, it goes to right back to 1. And then you go to 5, but that 5 goes where? 4, and then back to 1. Whoa, wait a minute here. Is that grammatically correct? In its language, it is A-OK. -okay. <laughs> okay, this is, this is like Chinese, all right? It works. In Chinese, that's good. <laughs> but you don't do that in Swahili or whatever it is over there. <laughs> it's a different language. They're different languages, and they work in different ways. So if you're trying to get in the groove of how this language works, you better know how the grammar works. But does a composer need to be aware of that? No, they're speaking their language. Just like when you when you speak, you don't go, okay now, got my subject, good, okay, verb. You know, you don't do that, do you? You're thinking about what you're trying to express and you're not worried about all those mechanics. They're part of you. <laughs> You've internalized them and they're somewhere tucked away in your brain. You know, it's there. And so you don't have to be aware of those things until you're maybe learning that other language and then you can use it to help you. But a native speaker isn't going to need that, right? So, another way it's, in, it's useful to us is that once, we, once it's something that we're explicitly aware of, not something like, um, you know, there are different kinds of decisions. Uh, like when you're driving, should I turn here? Yeah, you know, so that kind of decision making is a decision that you make. But when some little squirrel runs out in the road and you want to stop, you know, you hit the brake and you don't go, I would like to stop now. <laughs> I can go, you know. You know, it's not, it's not a, it's a decision, but it's a decision in a different way, right? So, if, if you speak Swahili here, you know, if you speak this language, common practice, you're just slamming on the brakes right here on the dominant, and you didn't have to think about it. You just, it's a knee jerk reaction. It's conditioned response. You do this, you speak your language. But if you're trying to get funky and do something else, you might say, hey, I want to do, I'm going to draw from this other language. I'm going to do something else. Or like, remember plagal functions? Well, if you realize, hey, that's a lesser used option and as a composer you decide to use it and exploit it to make it sound new and different and less cliched and less um, less classical, right? You want to sound romantic, you want to sound free from conventions and all that. And this is a little overused. Okay, well let me use a playful kind of motion at the end. And now you got something you can work with that fits your aesthetic. Okay, so sometimes it is good to be aware of it. Now, when you're aware of it, too, and you realize that somebody's playing with it, playing with the syntax, and saying, I want, I want the plagal thing here. I want to go a different route. Then you can appreciate it. You see what I mean? You're aware of that decision. You go, now, that was a decision. That was a choice, one of those conscious sorts, and it's significant to me. I understand what the composer's doing. Or maybe a deceptive motion. Maybe you just sort of it blew by you and you didn't really realize it. But once somebody says, hey, that's a deceptive motion, that's a dominant going to a tonic substitute, like a six or a funky other chord that isn't tonic, no, isn't one, but is serving a tonic function. You know, maybe it goes unexpectedly to flat six, or seven to minus seven to five, or something else that allows the leading tone to resolve, but is not the one chord that you expected. That deceptive motion then, it takes on a special weight for you, uh, a special meaning for you, because you know what should have been, should have, in quotation marks. And you can appreciate what actually happens better 
because you know that. You see what I mean by that? So you are better equipped to say and articulate what decisions the composer made and why they're expressive and why they're meaningful to you because you're aware of the language and the way it works. And that's a good thing. Okay. I think we better leave that one. There's one other issue that I want to deal with. Um, Amber took one option, which is just fine, but there's another way. If you look in the second, uh, it's really measure five, so let me put it over here. You've had, you've landed on your dominant, the five, and then we go five, one, two. Let me put some sharps so I don't have to write them everywhere. <laughs> Okay, five, seven, this chord continues, one, seven diminished six, one, six, this five, six, five here, one, one, one six, six, six. And then, what's my predominant chord? Did you get that? Did you get a two there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. two. I got a three. Yeah. Which measure? I got a two six. Okay, that's good. This is the second to last measure. I guess two six. Here's the deal. You see the motion going on? When you've got, when you've got dissonant notes, and this is going to be the focus of our next analysis, but when you have dissonant notes and they move before the bass note does, you should seriously consider using figures to express those notes, to show them, instead of making them into a chord. So it is possible to write 4, 7 there, and then show it moving to a 2, 6. But what we're trying to do is be sparing in our use of Roman numerals. Don't use so many. And instead, show the expressiveness of suspensions and retardations. Which of these is a retardation? Five to six. It's a sort of, six. what's kind of yeah, tricky about six. that is that it's a consonant one, and usually we mean distance. So I'm really looking at the sevens here. Seven to eight. Seven to eight, yeah. And this one, seven to six is? Suspension. 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 Because retardations, they're trying to advance to the next level, mm -hmm. but they're held back. Yeah, they're trying to go up, but suspensions go down. Okay, so retardation, suspension. When there's motion, you find the chord by looking here, the end of beat one, not on the downbeat. Because you know the suspension and the retardation are non-chord tones. They're embellishing the real notes, and the real notes emerge. So look at the eighth and the sixth above the bass and say, those are the chord tones, not the downbeat notes. So we use two right there, even though we're really getting it from over there, the end of one. That's going to be the way we look at things on the next one. Same thing here. We write five here, even though we don't get the notes of five right away. We get them on beat three. We get a six four going on. Now, actually, because he's, this passage, he's building up. He doesn't want to end there. Actually, the piano is building up to go somewhere else, so he breaks all the voice leading rules and instead moves up. Let's see, how, where's the six? Does it literally go up? G? Yeah, it goes up. So um, it becomes an octave, and the fourth becomes a fifth, right? Yeah, and that's for a reason. That's really weird, but it's because he's trying to go see the crescendo and the rising line in the piano. It's going, and it's going to break out in the next section. And so he's being unruly so that it can come crashing in on top of everything. Stick out at you. Take over from the voice. Okay, so, um, again, though, we look past the dissonance, and we go over here and say, okay, we're going to call it a 5 because what happens on beat 3, not because what happens on beat 2. Whenever you get the 4th, or the 7th, or the ninth, think like that.
get past the dissonance and be aware that it's very expressive in the way that it moves. And it, it really is expressive. It's wonderful. So, um, let's see. So we are. This is the first system, the last measure. trying to focus on how expressive that is, right? Now, if this were really a quarter seventh in a four seventh, it would need to resolve down, wouldn't it? So it would behave the same way. The only advantage of doing this is it highlights, doing the suspension retardation business, is it highlights those notes as special, calls them out. Instead of just assimilating them inside of a chord, it says, hey, these aren't in the chord and they need resolution, and here's how they resolve, and you trace that. So you're aware of the lines, which way they're going. Any questions about that part of it? Okay, one other thing about this passage, and that has to do with function. So, let's take a look at two options here. I'm curious if anybody did this another way. If you say, okay, here's my dominant end of phrase, but it also kicks off this one, so it continues. And then what Amber did was she put a tonic there. Fine. As long as you show that this is embellishing that tonic. See what she's doing? The tonic's the main thing, but see where it comes in? See the metrical placement issue? Mm -hmm. Isn't that also an embedded? You could go there, but we usually, if we can, we'll go with embellishment before we go to okay. embedded. I kind of said that it was both, but so if you can clearly see really easily the embellishment function of them. Go with that. Okay. That's right. Check this out. This is a different way. This measure is the same. Did you see the difference here? If I say that this is all dominant and it resolves to one on the next downbeat, I've got a very different situation. And now I need to explain this. Here, in the tonic expansion, I need to explain the five. Five doesn't naturally express tonic function, right? So I have to explain it. What has five got to do with a tonic expansion, a prolongation of tonic? Well, it's embellishing. We need to explain that five, or else this interpretation doesn't make any sense. Same thing here. Dominant for that whole measure, and more, two measures really. But in that measure, dominance, the thing we're asserting, it's dominant function. What's the one doing? What would you label it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Incomplete neighbor. And that says, hey, I leapt to it and I stepped, there's my connection. Just like here. See, it's very similar, isn't it? So it's kind of nice to make this similarity be reflected in my interpretation of it, too. And, primarily, I wanted to make this a tonic, a change to tonic here instead of mid-measure, because then the change coincides with a metrical change. I mean, a new, a new start. So that the metrical placement reinforces that idea that, hey, I'm starting there. I'm, I'm starting over. Listen to that spot and see how you feel about it. Here am I? Okay. So from sempre, that's the same spot I started with from before. could feel like, okay, here's my resolution, and then I build up into that spot, or I could hear it as, it's going to change the way I perform a little bit, 
on here is primarily dominant with some passing motion. And now the real change comes here. You see how that works? Now without me doing so much rebuttal. See what I'm doing? I am building into that downbeat and making it sound like a significant change there. Two very different performances. Which do you like better? Do you have a feeling right now about no, which like way you want to go with it? Uh, first or second. Which one? Second one. Second one? Okay. Like this then. It's important for you to realize that both are possible performances. They're both possible. But you need to know which one you like better because you are a performer. And, you know, even if you're an educator, you're also a performer, right? And so you need to have a sense of what you would want to do there because you need to develop your own voice, so, so to speak. You need to have convictions about stuff. And this is the source of those kinds of convictions. You say, this is how I want to play it. Or here's, and if you can teach, there are options and you can help your student recognize what they like then you'll be developing them. And the Bible says, train up a child in the way that he should go. And that, that word, the, the words there, indicate that there's a, there's a bent, a way in which they should go. And so you're helping them discover their way and not imposing yours. Do you see the difference there? It's a subtle difference, but in the way that that child should go, it's their way in the original um, Hebrew, not in the way that you decide they should go. There's a big difference between those two things. You see? So as a teacher, you have the chance to nurture them to figure out what they like and what they want to do and why and have a reason why. And in order to teach that, you better be doing it yourself or how in the world will you teach it? <laughs> if you don't value it enough to do it yourself and to say, hmm, I want, it. I want to feel like I'm driving to this place and hear a significant change on that downbeat, if you can't, if you don't see that as a possibility with other options, you know, with a whole range of options, and you're choosing one out of them, how are you going to teach somebody else how to make decisions? You've got to lay out decisions, right? And explore them together and say, what would you like? Why? And be sensitive to metrical, metrical placement and line and, you know, all these things that we care about. Notice that the voice... The upper notes in the piano are going up in that last measure of the first system, right? But the voice is going down. They're doing this. They're actually crossing one another, aren't they? They share the G sharp, but then they go on. Contrary motion. There's this sense of going in that measure, and to my mind, arrival on the, the next. See the voice? You see how that works? It rises and it falls. So it works, to my mind, it works really well with the melody because it turns at that point in descent that this should be the most significant change and not this. Here you're on your way somewhere and there you arrive melodically. So that's how I would sort through that issue. I would not only bring in the harmony and the chords, but I would attend to the way the melody works with those chords and with that bass line. See what I'm after there? I should probably write it because I care enough about it. So it goes up to B here, and it gets there by step, even though the piano is doing this, downward. So I'll darken those. And then it comes down, and so on. All right. Unfortunately, Pavarotti, <clears throat> may he rest in peace, <laughs> does everything full throttle or he doesn't. But there's not a whole lot of nuance in his singing. You know what I mean by that? Yeah, he's, <laughs> he's got yeah. It. <laughs> It's either all on or, it's, you know, subdued. But, um, but there, there isn't a whole lot of building and decrescendoing within a phrase. There's a loud phrase, and there's a soft phrase. But I hope you hear now how it could be different. So listen to it one more time. Yeah, next he goes real soft. Sure. But he changes his tone quality. But that doesn't happen within the phrase. You see what I mean? 
it's all kind of all right up here and I'm really intense the whole way and then okay now I'm not you know <laughs> but it's not it's sta it's uh, step tiered there this is where I'm looking for tiered dynamics not uh, not building and and nuanced so could there have been like another reason why maybe you what you think that? That? and it like is was that like a convention or could it have had something to do with the way that the recording was done at the time it seems like it's more a function of the way he sang he had such a this natural technique vocally that he I seemed to just do it that way happen. and didn't really... <laughs> I'm not a vocalist, so I'm just asking if you're asking. Yeah. It's a good question. Yeah, I'm not sure. It just seemed to be his, his normal way and didn't, he didn't really think about that very much. No question, probably. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> sorry, everyone, sorry. <laughs> Sing it with me once. How would you do it? Alma del core, spiritu del alma, sempre constante adoro. Yeah, and we'd have to build through that, right? Because we're going to go into this big section. But, um, yeah, I heard that. That's nice. Very nuanced. That's good. La, da, da, di. Right, you go for that. Da, 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 come away. La, da, 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 da. At least that's how I do it. <laughs> da, 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 You know, so you give it some shape there. Good. Let me pause that. <laughs>